um, in the coming days. Um, and starting off, if you could all please mute your lines um, so we can hear the speakers and not be disturbed by the background noise. Um, and take a moment as we get started to make sure your name, your full name, your pronouns and your organization are listed in um, your panel. Um, you go to the participants section, find your name, scroll over the word more and then click on rename and you'll be able to do that. Um, please, uh, as we move through the program, if you have questions, especially for the speakers, um, if you could please directly message Stephanie Moore. Um, you should find her in the participants panel. She'll be um, managing all of the questions that come in throughout the program. And um, before I get started and provide you with an overview of the program, I want to just um, say that we would otherwise be presenting kind of highlights of our year or report from the board, but um, given that we're all virtual now, uh, we took advantage of that platform and presented a report through Zoom, and that too is posted on our website. So I encourage everybody to take a look at it if you're interested in hearing about um, the kind of work that we did in, in 2020. So first I want to thank our sponsors, um, Hawaii Public Health Institute, you all are familiar with HiFi, um, for the technical assistance that's being provided today. We have Stephanie Moore and Makamai Namahoe with us today. They're behind the scenes operating all the logistics and a big shout out to them. And then Medicines 360 is a new sponsor for us. I wanna just uh, introduce you to Medicines 360. They're fighting to make access to medicines for all women a reality. And their mission is to remove costs as a barrier to health by developing and providing affordable women's pro health products. Um, they zero in on mo the most pressing needs in women's health and create new models to address them. Okay, um, just in introducing you to today's program, um, we will be providing the election results. Um, Pedro has that to report. And uh, we'll be congratulating all of you who will be coming on as 2021 Board of Directors. Um, we have some uh, something different this time, uh, Public Health Heroes Awards. Um, and I won't uh, say too much about that, just a very different uh, idea, and we hope you enjoy it um, as much as we, we anticipate um, we all will. Uh, we have APHA's president uh, leading up to this meeting. He was president-elect, but as of last month, the end of last month, he is the president for our American Public Health Association, uh, Dr. Jose Ramon Fernandez-Pena. And we have um, a session focused on racism and public health um, with two featured speakers, um, Drs. Jonathan Okamura and Rebecca Delafield, both from the University of Hawaii. So together we have kind of a nice um, perspective with uh, local uh, experts and national uh, perspective by um, Dr. Fernandez Pena. And we will be doing um, some breakout sessions. So we hope you um, enjoy that. It's a little bit of kind of what we all look forward to and that networking and saying hi and um, around specific, a specific topic, of course. But, um, and then lastly, I um, would suggest that you get your favorite beverage, put it nearby. Um, we will be doing a, a bit of a toast at the end in celebration of uh, HPHA's 75th anniversary meeting and our first virtual meeting in history. Um, and we'll be doing, uh, we'll be recognizing some folks for um, their contributions to this program and over the year. So with that, let me hand the program 
over to our president elect, um, Pedro Haro Arvizu. Pedro. Aloha, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am very happy to be announcing the results uh, of our 2021 uh, board elections. First, I'd like to say thank you very much for all of those of you who voted this year. I feel very good about the board that we have for 2021, uh, but more importantly, I'm very excited to be able to work with all of you. Uh, the seats on the board are up on staggered years as per the bylaws. So for the open seats this year, uh, Dr. Graham Tutt has moved up to be our board secretary. Congratulations. Uh, Reverend John Hawley Tomoso will serve another two years as an at-large member from Maui. And we have gained four new board members this year. Uh, Leo Kadia Conlon, Jobal Thomas uh, will serve as our new Oahu at-large members, while Stephanie Moore will serve as our new at-large member from Kauai. And finally, Trisha Kejimura will be stepping in into the role of president-elect, becoming uh, HPHA president in 2022. We're really excited with Trisha's background with, in mental health. Uh, we're excited to bring this into the forefront more of public health. And we're excited about the expertise that all of our new members and all of our continuing board members will bring to the 20 and 21 season. Could you please join me in congratulating our new board of directors? Yay, I'll clap, I guess, because I can't hear you. Um, so let's move on to something a little fun. And because of that, I am going to have to change my background to this. There we go. And uh, Stephanie, if you wouldn't mind uh, bringing up. Oh, no, 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 wait, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Next slide, Sally, not yet. I'm jumping the gun. Uh, we have four, four board members that are stepping up the board this year. Leonard Allen, Patricio Batani, and oh. Dr. Elizabeth Michael. Oh. No, that's at the Did end. You? Sorry. I'm Are sorry. That... Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can go ahead. You were right. You were right the first time, Pedro. <laughs> All right. So we're, <laughs> I, have, I have my background set on. So Stephanie, if you wouldn't mind bringing up the other slide. Ellie, can you stop share, please? Sure. So, you know, I wanted to point out that one of the greatest things that I always heard was about how Mr. Rogers from Mr. Rogers neighborhood would say that when he was a little boy, he would see scary things in the news and his mom would say to him, look for the helpers. You will always see, find people who are helping. And that would tend to make people feel better about a difficult situation. And in the middle of the worst pandemic in the century, the public health community, all of you have stepped up to be those helpers. And boy, has our community stepped up. As part of our 75th year of, of the Hawaii Public Health Association celebration, we thought it'd be a good opportunity for us to shine a light on those helpers, the people and organizations that have gone above and beyond this year. We asked for nominations from all of you, and you came back with 16 public health uh, professionals and organizations that showed examples of innovation, action, and heroic efforts during times of adversity. We will be presenting a few batches of them to you at today's agenda throughout. And to help me with these presentations, I'd like to introduce Michelle Tagorda, undergraduate advisor at the Office of Public Health Studies at the University of Hawaii and the Hawaii Public Health Association's treasurer who will be presenting our first award. Thank you, Pedro. It's so exciting to be with all of you today. Um, and yes, this is a, definitely a, an exciting feature of this year's annual meeting to celebrate our public health heroes um, in our community. So I'll begin with our first hero. During this pandemic, Lieutenant Governor Green has shown leadership, transparency, and trust of Hawaii's population. His daily updates, even when he himself is sick, shows exceptional dedication to the public health of his constituents and patients. His updates are viewed by hundreds of Hawaii residents as a trusted, honest source. He has continued to work as an emergency department physician while working at the same time in his role as Lieutenant Governor. He has provided us with an, an excellent role model of a public health leader this year. Lieutenant Governor Josh Green is a public health hero. Thank you, Michelle. Our next public health hero is Lisa Keel. 
Ms. Keel has always been an incredible resource for students at the Office of Public Health Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. However, her time and efforts have expanded to superhuman levels since the beginning of COVID-19 and associated quarantine mandate. As mental health among students, faculty and community members has declined. She has provided invaluable support as a trained social worker, utilizing a strength-based approach that has empowered others to engage in supporting themselves and their communities during these challenging times. She has also prov proved to be a critical resource in linking students and their families with needed resources. In addition to this, she has supported local public health organizations by providing linkages to students, uh, to, uh, linkages to student support and strengthening collaborative efforts between community organizations and the Office of Public Health Studies. Lisa Keel, you are a public health hero. Our next hero is Auntie Jessie. Auntie Jessie promotes health education and prevention outreach in the rural underserved community of Kau. Most of her time was spent volunteering because of limited funding. She enrolled in Maui Community College Community Health Workers courses. She's a participant with the Papa Ololakahi Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders COVID-19 Task Force Committee. She attends the Hawaii Public Health Institute Community Health Workers statewide meetings and has coordinated a free COVID-19 testing efforts in Pahala in collaboration with different organizations and departments in the community. Auntie Jessie serves, continues to serve as Kau Rural Health Community Association's Executive Director and Program Coordinator and the Hawaii Island Rural Health and Hawaii State Rural Health Association Board Representative and is a member of the National Association of Community Health Workers. Auntie Jessie is also planning another COVID-19 testing in Hawaiian Ocean View with the, for the Marshallese and Pacific Islander communities. She continues to assist with COVID-19 outreach and is preparing to reopen the Resources and Distance Learning Center also in her community. And Jesse, you are a public health hero. And our next honoree, um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and associated challenges, Dr. Catherine Perko has actively engaged in our local community to increase awareness of critical issues and provide public health perspectives and expertise which are especially critical in this era of increasingly alternative facts. She has spearheaded outreach efforts both on and off campus, including initiating an extensive public health student needs assessment and coordinating development of a COVID-19 resource guide in collaboration with a pair of graduate level public health students. Through guest written articles in Civil Beat, Dr. Perko has also provided critical community education and perspective. In a research context, she is currently leading coordination efforts to develop and produce a special COVID-19 related issue of Hawaii Journal of Health and Social Welfare. Dr. Perkle, you are a public health hero. Our next um, public health hero is the maternal, maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. This program gives pregnant women and families, particularly those considered at risk, the necessary resources and skills to raise children who are physically, socially, and emotionally healthy and ready to learn. During the pandemic, the program provided innovative support for vulnerable women during pregnancy and to parents with young children up to kindergarten entry. The program supported home visiting programs across the state in their transition to telehealth visits and while supporting vulnerable families. To the people of the maternal infant and early childhood home visiting programs, you are public health heroes. Thank you so much. That is our first batch of heroes. Uh, thank you, Michelle. She will be back uh, with me Michelle. later on. Oh. Later on. Oh. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. There we go. Uh, Michelle will be back later on with me to present another batch of heroes. But for now, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Jose Ramon Fernandez Peña. Besides serving as the president of the American Public Health Association, Dr. Fernandez Peña is the director of health professions advising at Northwestern University 
and is an emeritus professor in the Department of Health Education at San Francisco State University, where his work focused on health workforce diversity and cross-cultural communication and health. Dr. Fernandez Peña is also the founder and executive director of, well, of the Welcome Back Initiative, a program to assist immigrant health professionals already living in the U.S. through the necessary steps to enter the U.S. health workforce, which is particularly important right now as we're facing a workforce shortage. The initiative currently includes centers in California, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Washington, Maryland, New York, Colorado, Pennsylvania, and Maine, and hopefully pretty soon in Hawaii. Uh, in 2011, it received the Iparibus Unum Prize from the Migration Policy Institute. Dr. Fernandez Peña was recognized by the White House as a champion of change for his work on immigrant integration and the Henry J. Montes President Award from the American Public Health Association's Latino Caucus. Dr. Fernandez Peña earned his medical degree from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and his master's degree in public administration from New York University. After his speech, Dr. Fernandez Peña will host a question and answer. Please go ahead and send your questions to Stephanie, who will be moderating the questions afterwards. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fernandez Peña. Thank you very much, Pedro, for that kind introduction. And hello, everybody. I am planning on sharing my screen. I hope that worked. Yes, excellent. And now I can have my act together here. All right. So good evening, everybody. Yes, I'm Jose Ramon Fernandez Peña, and I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes talking with you about what lessons I have learned and some thoughts that I have from my second pandemic. And why I'm calling it my second pandemic will become clear pretty soon. But before I get started, I want to take a moment to acknowledge and honor the Potawatomi, Odawa, and Ojibwe tribes are the original people of the land upon which a Northwestern University stands today. I also want to bring you greetings from uh, APHA and concretely from Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Deanna Washington, and Dr. Aaron Guest. Of course, uh, you all know Dr. Benjamin. He has been with us for a number of years. But Drs. Washington and Guest were elected to their positions as chair of the executive board and as speaker of the governing council at our annual meeting a couple of weeks ago. I also want to spend a couple of minutes talking about some of the resources that APHA has been, work APHA has been working on this year. And as you and probably anybody in public health knows very well, we have been very engaged over the last eight months in all matters pertaining to the pandemic. And Dr. Benjamin has been very busy providing uh, expert testimony all over the place on, in Congress, working with other partners and um, over the media, oftentimes just uh, clarifying facts and ensuring that evidence-based answers are uh, with the news outlets across the country. Some other members of the board have also been very busy in this space. One of my colleagues, Dr. Kathy Troisi, for example, has been providing expert testimony in cases where the importance of wearing masks at voting places was challenged. I won't tell you where this was, but it starts with a T and ends with excess. Uh, I have been working with the Spanish speaking media as well. And these resources that you see here, you probably already saw them in the, in the APHA page, but they're really interesting and comprehensive. I think the COVID uh, guidance was the first one we put together. And I'm very proud of the fact that we actually created a document in Spanish that was not a mere translation of the English document. So those are available through the website. Uh, we, you probably also know that we hosted a series of webinars. Uh, the COVID-19 conversations that brought together folks from all over the country to talk about the up to the moment information that we had available about COVID-19. Another new resource, another resource that we have is uh, this series of webinars that we launched called Advancing Racial Equity. And some of you might remember that uh, back in 2015, we launched a series of webinars entitled The Impact of Racism and Health. 
on the wellness of the nation. This new series is focusing more specifically on racial equity and on calling a spade a spade and finally stopping walking around and accepting that race was considered a social determinant of health and taking a deeper dive into understanding that it's in fact racism and not race which acts as a social determinant of health. And I'm very happy that Dr. Okawura and Dr. Delafield are gonna be speaking about this later on today. Uh, another important aspect of our work, and I hope that uh, both either you, Hallie, or Tenaya have participated in this, is uh, the MUIP, the Member Unit Effectiveness and Engaging Engagement Project. This is a project that APHA started last year with the goal, as you see here, to better understand how we're structured and how can we be more responsive and more effective to the membership of APHA. There's a link here that you can follow and you can get all the latest reports on what we have found to date. It's a really interesting exercise that is questioning how the organization is currently established. As you know, there are a number of components, affiliates, uh, speaks, caucuses, and other components that make up the association. And the challenge of managing effectively the needs of so many groups in so many spaces is uh, keeps coming up. So as we approach the 150th anniversary of the association in 2022, we want to make sure that uh, we have a structure that really is well suited to serve professional students, affiliates, members, uh, caucuses, and any other interest groups that make up APHA. So now on to then and now, and I, I'm calling this session Reflections from, from uh, my pandemics. and. When I look back at the past eight months and I try to make some sense of where, where we've been, I can't help but feel like I'm living in a flashback to 1985 in New York City as the AIDS epidemic was taking off. I had just arrived in the United States to attend graduate school and I found myself in the epicenter of a killer wave that over the 10 years that I lived in New York took hundreds of friends and my partner. I was confronted for the first time in my life, I think, with a combination of fear, anger, and frustration that motivated me to join a group that was actually doing something to prevent the spread of the virus. GMHC, the first uh, community-based organization that came together to fight AIDS, was offering assistance and support to people living with HIV since 1981 and had at the time the top-notch prevention programs in the country, not the world, and was also engaged in advocacy to secure funding and services for the populations that were being most affected by the virus. It was a call to action at a time of governmental neglect and inaction. It was a, a vacuum of leadership that ultimately led to the death of 32 million of people around the world. And today about 40 million people are living with HIV. While we still don't have a vaccine nor a cure, HIV disease can now be treated via a combination of medications, assuming that you can afford the medications and that you have access to the medications. Some of the most important lessons that I learned during these years have guided my work and sustained me during this time we are living. I remain committed and appreciate now, perhaps much more than I did in the beginning, the importance of prevention, treatment and advocacy as, as three key elements of uh, successful public health interventions. When I joined GMHC, the organization had been founded by six gay white men living in New York City and the resources were very scarce and it was all very sketchy. The first service that was created was a hotline that was actually the answering machine of one of the members of the group and that's where all the sources of information, all the questions were coming in and then the information was going out via mimeograph. Some of you may remember those things and Xerox newsletters. 
At the time I joined them as a volunteer in 1987, there were no services in Spanish. So I was uh, very happy to participate in the creation of training programs for volunteers to carry the prevention message in Spanish speaking communities. So why is or how is any of this relevant today? So here we are enter COVID-19 and what we're seeing today in many ways is no different than what I remember from the 1980s. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind uh, is the medicalization of a public health emergency. Like HIV, the urgent need to treat patients consumed, by, consumed all the energy and most of the resources available in the early stages of, the, of uh, ep the epidemic. Prevention was, as it often is, an afterthought. Like with HIV, the federal government has shown no interest, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing my track, has shown no interest in, at all in developing a national prevention strategy, refusing to speak about the virulence of this coronavirus, and uh, has not only the refusing to model healthier behaviors, has not only delayed, but has unnecessarily politicized safer choices. Like with HIV, uh, the small number of providers at all levels that come from the populations most at re risk creates barriers to the treatment and reinforces mistrust in service agencies. The need for culturally appropriate prevention programs is as equally hampered as is the implementation of effective contact tracing programs. And the impact of this lack of diversity in the health workforce is especially severe in the context of mental health services. Like with HIV, the dangers of living in a country where access to health services is most often contingent upon employment is once again exposed in this pandemic. We're finding out that as people need their health services the most is when uh, it's right now, and as many businesses are struggling to keep employers or to keep open, of course, the employees, the first thing they lose is not only their income, but their, their health coverage. And like with uh, HIV, well, similar to HIV in this case, homophobia was the main driver in the early days of the AIDS crisis. And today we see very clearly the impact of racism and all enablers that feed the spread of COVID-19, from housing to educational attainment to employment, to any and all the aspects that are impacted negatively by racist practices and structures. So Debbie Downer is now going to take a break and let you all breathe for a moment and try to come up with some things that I'd like to focus on moving forward. So the first thing that, that is helping me sleep these days is that I see the, an incoming administration with a different set of priorities. And with this comes again an opportunity to advocate for reinvesting in our public health infrastructure from staffing to facilities to supplies and to re-legitimizing the rightful role of prevention and public health in a situation like the one we live in. I think that it's also an opportunity to look again as we have been doing with varying degrees of success at the, at the our health uh, our workforce and ask ourselves does it accurately reflect the population it aims to serve in terms of race ethnicity language culture values beliefs etc this has proven to be a big challenge in some areas where their historic mistrust in governmental institutions and programs has become an unsurmountable but insurmountable barrier for some communities accessing services in a timely manner and also for contact tracing efforts. In a particular county in Maryland, I forget the county, for example, they received federal funding to launch a contact tracing program. And they did, and they trained about 50 contact tracers without re remembering that three quarters of the population of that county was mostly Spanish speaking, and there were no Spanish speakers in the group of contact tracers. I think it's also, uh, Another opportunity to uh, 
continue to advocate for uh, the, the need for mental health services. This has been brought again uh, to the fore, especially for youth and people in recovery programs. And for this particular service, again, the need for cultural and linguistic parity between patients and providers is essential. Something else that we have to be thinking about looking forward, I think, is uh, telemedicine. Telemedicine that we have been talking about for a very long time has been a lifesaver for many at this time. Both providers and patients are getting used to it, but after all these years, uh, we're finally seeing it surge. And not without problems, of course. And some of the things that are, have, are becoming suddenly challenges is the issue of licensure across states. And uh, of course, the ability to provide reimbursement for for services rendered. We are finding that some folks that work at the university, for example, or some students who have gone back to their home states are accessing mental health services via telemedicine, but provide the provider is perhaps not licensed in the state where they are currently living. So that poses challenges to, to the access of, to these uh, services. Excuse me, I need a sip of water. <coughs> Last, but certainly not least, uh, at the root of many of the health disparities, like the ones we're seeing again in this pandemic, we quickly find a long history of structural and institutional racism. I'm sorry. And the impact of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just, <clears throat> And the impact of colonization. And I'm certainly not here to tell you what that looks or feels like, but I'm, I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you. The recent months and the civil unrest that we have seen in the streets all over the country regarding the blatant uh, way in which some segments of society are grabbing the flag of racist practices and grabbing or taking hold of, uh, of fascist uh, approaches, speeches, symbols, is alarming at the very least. I am very hopeful that the incoming administration will take a strong stance against these manifestations. And uh, I think as citizens, we must continue to demand from our elected officials and from our federal government that this comes to an end as soon as possible. I want to say a special thank you, Mahalo Nui Loa, to Hali and Tenaya for helping me and guiding me through what I was going to do with you today. And uh, Gerald Oda, who I know you all know, is, uh, has been one of those characters that I will never forget. He was one of the first persons I met when I became active, an active member of APHA. And I think it was back in 2005 when he approached me and said, you will be running for, for president of APHA. And Jerry, I don't know if you're in the audience today, but that little bug you put behind my ear many years ago is one of the reasons I, I decided to throw my head in the ring last year. So I'm going to stop now and I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that here and open myself up for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fernandez Pena. So we do have one question. Um, the first question is, can you give more specifics about advocacy approaches for expanding mental health services? And what mental health services are deemed as more urgent from APHA? I'm thinking about a, a, a good answer to that question. What is fundamental health services? I think that one example that comes to mind is some work that we did in Maryland 
through the Welcome Back program, the program that I run that works with foreign trained health professionals who are living in the US and we integrate them or trying to integrate them into the US health workforce in some level. In Montgomery County, there's a large contingent of uh, non-English speaker asylees and refugees. And in one of the assessments the county did of its own needs, they found that mental health was especially important for this group, especially given the trauma of uh, asylum and refugee life. We had a number of participants in the Welcome Back program that had been mental health professionals in their countries of origin or in their countries of training, but, but did not have the licenses, to, the necessary credentials to practice in the United States. As you may know, uh, individuals like licensed clinical social workers, for example, require 3,000 supervised clinical hours before they can apply for licensure. So we worked very closely with the Board of Behavioral Health in the state of Maryland to create a new licensed profession that was neither a social worker, nor a clinical psychologist, nor a psychiatrist. It was an intermediate or a lower grade professional, perhaps more a la case manager, that was able to provide services in the language needed under the clinical supervision of a licensed U.S. health professional. So in that creative approach enabled the county to quickly bring to the fore a number of, of, uh, of, of mental health professionals that, that could work with a population at need in the language that they needed. Uh, the point of advocacy at this point was the Board of Behavioral Health. So it wasn't necessarily elected officials, it wasn't anything like that. Another point that, that could uh, be sought for in this thing is the fact that sometimes these individuals do not speak English or they do not speak enough English to communicate with their supervisors or with the context in which they are working. So we created an accelerated health focused ESL curriculum specifically designed for these professionals that instead of taking the typical three to five years of sitting in a class can take individuals in one year from no hablo ingles to a uh, I'm here to work with you, how can I help you? The advocacy point at that, uh, with that curriculum was the community college for them to accept this curriculum as something they would offer in their ESL department. So these are kinds of examples that I have seen work in regards to concrete advocacy efforts for mental health services. Uh, what mental health services are deemed as the more urgent from APHA? I'm not sure I understand the question because I don't think that APHA deems uh, things more necessary than other. I think I'm speaking from my own experience working at uh, here in Evanston of what I see, for example, from the students we are serving and uh, the impact of the pandemic on their well being, on their ability to manage not only the stress of living under the environment we're living in especially for students of color, but also of living through school through Zoom while at home with their parents when they are 19 and their hormones and everything is roaring for freedom and liberty and exploring. So uh, I think we also have a number of reports uh, that speak to the resurgence of uh, domestic abuse cases or other car kinds of situations that are arising in multi-generational households. Uh, we have also reports of individuals that are in, in uh, recovery programs, for example, for whom the need to stay in touch with the providers is critical to the success of their recovery. So these are some of the things that I would, in my opinion, are uh, important at this point. Thank you. The next question is asking, can you talk about how you are seeing immigrants dealing with the pandemic across the US? Can I talk about, and can you please repeat the question, Stephanie? Yes, so the question is, can you talk about how you are seeing immigrants dealing with the pandemic across the US? <laughs> Just last night, we held a, a session at, at my office 
uh, on racism and its impact on the pandemic. And one of the speakers spoke very eloquently about immigrants. And uh, so a number of ways in which it's affecting immigrants. Immigrants in this country oftentimes are in the jobs that nobody else wants to take. So certainly in the mainland, the, those who are picking the crops in California or in Michigan or in Illinois or anywhere else tend to be immigrants. Those who serve in the, in, the, in the service industry, either uh, stocking shelves in the, 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 the grocery stores or places like that, those who are emptying the trucks that, that bring the food across the country, many of those who work at nursing homes where we have seen the vast majority of deaths from COVID-19 are immigrants who are working as nurses aides, CNAs, or medical assistants, or perhaps if they're lucky as nurse practitioner, nurse, uh, vocational nurses. So the immigrant community also historically has no access to health services because they're offered times paid under the table. So they don't will not have social security, even though they have contributed to it over the years and are not covered by any kind of insurance, as we noted, uh, because insurance is based on legal employment for the most part. Immigrants also oftentimes don't speak English and therefore access to information that is timely relevant and culturally accessible to them is not there. Immigrants also uh, are the ones that oftentimes care for the sick at home. We sometimes hire immigrants to either clean our homes or take care of our elderly parents and also do not have the protections that any kind of system would afford them in that context. So they're certainly at higher risk. They are the ones that are working at meat packing industries. They are the ones that are working in spaces where they cannot phone in their job like I can. They cannot zoom into their job. They are by necessity exposed by means of either taking public transit or by the kind of work that they do or their inability to implement any of the things that we know work like physical distance or masking. So just to name a few, these are some of the cha challenges we see across the country when it comes to immigrant communities. Thank you. So um, kind of to stick with the immigrant communities, um, and you had briefly mentioned contact tracing in your presentation. Um, locally here in Hawaii, community health workers were not utilized as contact tracers, and we did see uh, uptick in numbers in some of our um, migrant populations. Um, and so do you have any thoughts or advice on how community health workers can be better utilized during this pandemic? I think that community health workers are just one of the of the magical members of the public health workforce and uh, primarily because in many many cases community health workers come from the communities they serve so they have instant street cred with communities in need and therefore they oftentimes not only speak the language but understand the culture so for example in the case of contact tracers if I am in the United States and I'm not fully authorized to work and somebody comes to me and asks me to give them the names of the 10 people that I've been in contact with so that the hospital or the public health department can contact them to tell them that immediately raises 75,000 flags in my head because I'm watching an administration that is reminding me every day that I am a bad hombre, that I'm a criminal and a rapist and a drug dealer. So my livelihood and that of my family and my friends is at stake, like hell, excuse my language, am I gonna tell anybody where my friends live or what their names are? So a community health worker from the community may start by, they don't even need to, to to think about this because they understand it, because they live it. And they are a trusted member of the community and they are a trusted member of the health team. I will tell you, or I will tell Pedro, because his name is Pedro Aro. And I'm betting that he understands what I'm saying. Pedro, te voy a hacer dos preguntas. And he probably will be willing to listen to me. I have some credibility with him. So, Pedro, am I right? <laughs> So there. 
So without this uh, level of, of uh, competency, parity, cultural, linguistic, and otherwise, it's like, like I always talk about this, it's like asking a nutritionist to tell me as a Mexican that I have to cut back on my tortillas in my diet. If you know what tortillas are in my diet, you don't ask me to do that. Right, so they're they're implicit and tacits that go with this kind of cultural and linguistic parity, and I think that uh, community health workers bring those in spades. Thank you so much. Our next question is: Has APHA been invited to weigh in on the administration's public health agenda? <laughs> uh, In which administration? <laughs> I believe the new one. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Hallie. So I just spoke with Dr. Benjamin a, a couple of days ago. And while APHA has not been directly invited to sit on the, on the current uh, panel for COVID, for example, uh, Dr. Benjamin has been in contact with uh, a number of members of the transition team. And that's probably all I can say. Okay, thank you. My next question is, as more organizations are working to become anti-racist, can you think about what are some steps that organizations can take to do that? It's a great question. Uh, I, I, I think that the first and most important step, like in so many other spaces, is to acknowledge the fact that racism exists and that racism is a, a, a destructive force. If we start from that place and we start to take look at it uh, from a more, more culturally humble position in which we're willing to learn and willing to become a lifelong learner about where it comes, how it's fed, and how it's stopped is a wonderful way to start. I think that what I would not do, I, was, I would read. There's a number of publications, and I don't have any in front of me right now, but I can get you some resources in, in, from that space. Because I think that sometimes in, in a well-meaning or well-intentioned way, we may go to the black person in the room to ask them to help me understand. And that is certainly not something that we want to do. And I think that, I mean, I'm sure uh, Dr. Okamura is gonna speak about these things at length as well. But the job is on us to learn, to understand, to accept that this is a problem, to educate ourselves about how these racist structures and this 200 years of, uh, of slavery and uh, genocide from the original peoples in the country and colonization has impacted the country we are today. And without wanting to destroy everything, starting to understand that we can play a role to mitigate the impact that these structures have had over the years. So the first step, again, I think is acknowledging and accepting that this is an issue and a problem and then educating ourselves about how we can become not allies. The ally is the EC label that we all want to put a label on. I'm an ally. I want, I want to be a worker. I want to be an actively engaged uh, member of the group that is working towards changing this. Thank you. And this will be our last question. You talked about how the current pandemic seems to mimic the HIV pandemic in the 1980s. What do you consider to be the bright spots in the current COVID-19 pandemic and have we learned and that we are applying now? The first thing that comes to mind uh, is that we are apparently close to having a vaccine that is sounding promising and that was never the case with HIV so I think that's one of the bright spots I think that another bright spot again is that we're about to change administrations and the incoming administration is, has already stated its belief in science and in evidence-based practices, which is refreshers. Let's not forget that it took Reagan years 
years to even say the word AIDS. And uh, there were eight years of Reagan and four years of Bush before we really got into anything serious. Uh, have we learned? I'm, I'm not sure that we have learned much from the experiences of the past. I see us making the same mistakes and I see us finding ourselves in a similar space and structure. Uh, we still have no universal health care access. We still don't have a health workforce that reflects the diversity of the population we live in. We still don't have uh, a fully funded and well organized uh, public health infrastructure. The pandemic response team that was assembled or put together under the Obama administration was destroyed during this administration. So I don't know that we, and perhaps I'm talking, this is not we, this is the outer we. <laughs> I like to think that we are here like-minded individuals that we are hoping to do the best we can with a, a, as few resources as we are given or as we have. Mahalo again for uh, your presentation and questions. And I am- Thank you very much. Pedro. And, and you know what's wonderful? Well, you ended exact, you ended your last word exactly at the time that we had allotted in the, in, in the agenda. So uh, we can't thank you enough for, uh, being here with us today even though you would have been here with us today had we been able to to travel so thank you so much for for making the virtual trip with us and for uh giving us your uh, your expertise and your time um dr fernandez peña thank you so much again um and as we transition back into our public health heroes i would like to bring back michelle michelle would you like to um and stephanie if you wouldn't mind putting up the our next batch of 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 um, heroes. Michelle, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Pedro. Um, so we'll begin with our, our next batch of heroes. And so our first hero of this next batch will be um, the Hawaii State Department of Health. Its employees, leaders, volunteers, staff, and many more have been working extremely hard throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. They are often underappreciated for all of the crucial preventative and problem solving work they do. They have played key roles in outreach, contact investigation, contact tracing, testing, reporting, data collection, and more. To the people of the Hawaii State Department of Health, you are public health heroes. Our next public health hero is Jason De La Cruz. Mr. De La Cruz works out of the Hawaii District Health Office for the Hawaii Department of Health and serves as a conduit between the Hawaii County Civil Defense, elected officials, public health nursing disease investigation, epidemiology, and DOH Medical Reserve Corps volunteers to expand services during this pandemic. I was tired just reading all of those things. I can't imagine actually doing them. He was he has a lot on his shoulders and his colleagues believe he keeps everyone upbeat and doing their best during this trying time. The trilogy at this district office is public health preparedness, public health nursing disease investigation, and, Marine, uh, and medical reserve corps volunteers. This group working behind the scenes is grateful to know that someone has acknowledged their work to improve Hawaii's public health. Jason De La Cruz, you are a public health hero. Our next um, public health hero is the Hawaii Public Health Institute. HiFi has demonstrated extraordinary leadership in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the early days of the pandemic, HiFi mobilized leaders and organizations in public health and healthcare to advise Governor Ige and his administration regarding a statewide stay-at-home order, providing evidence-based guidelines for preventing widespread transmission across Hawaii's communities. In addition, through their weekly COVID-19 updates, HiFi has served to inform stakeholders and the broader community about changes to county and state guidelines, as well as resources and financial assistance available to families and children impacted by the economic and school shutdowns. Importantly, a learning community has been established through HiFi's bi-weekly COVID-19 public health action webinars, which continue to feature leading organizations and experts in public health, medicine, research, and governance. 
bringing attention to the most pressing needs and opportunities facing Hawaii's communities during the pandemic. Kudos to the entire team at HiFi for swiftly responding to the call for leadership, knowledge, and action in these most challenging times. To the people of the Hawaii Public Health Institute, you are public health heroes. And I promise we didn't fix this. It just so happened to happen this way. Uh, but our next public health hero is my co-presenter, Michelle Tagorda. Uh, the impacts of COVID-19 and the associated lockdowns and quarantine have been sorely felt across Hawaii and have highlighted critical disparities within our communities, including among university students. Ms. Tagorda has worked tirelessly to address these disparities at multiple levels. Within her role as an outstanding academic advisor at the Office of Public Health Studies at UH Manoa, she has, enacted, she has acted as a caring and compassionate support person and invaluable resource for both new and continuing students. She develops strong relationships and provides a safe space for her students, many of whom are members of vulnerable communities. As a true public health professional in action, she has gone above and beyond linking students and their families with essential community resources and assuming new responsibilities within the Office of Public Health Studies. Michelle Tagorda, you are a public health hero. Thank you, Pedro. <laughs> um, and our last uh, public health hero in this batch, we have Dr. Victoria Fan. Victoria has put in tremendous amount of work to improve Hawaii's response to COVID from her work supporting Department of Health's Behavioral Health Division with isolation, quarantine capacity, setting up the state dashboard, looking at mental health and substance abuse due to COVID-19, to establishing the Hawaii Pandemic Applied Modeling Workgroup, or HIPAM, which provides the state with daily, daily COVID forecasts. Dr. Fan, you are a public health hero. Thank you so much to all of our heroes on this batch. We have one more batch of heroes coming up, but for now, we're gonna move on to the next part of our agenda. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Tanaya Jackman, who is a Cancer Control Strategic Partnerships Manager at the American Cancer Society. She serves on the Hawaii Public Health Association Board as the affiliate representative to the Governing Council of the American Public Health Association. She is the co-chair of the Climate Change and Health Intersectional Committee of the American Public Health Association. And she has been working with a dedicated planning group to kick off HPHA's Racial Justice and Health Equity Initiative with, this, with the session she will now introduce. Tanaya. Thank you so much. I am very pleased to be here and so grateful for all the heroes and also for Jose Ramon's um, talk, which really led into this. So our session is titled Racism in Public Health. We're gonna be focusing on recognizing past and present systems that perpetuate racial injustice and exploring actions to create equitable and inclusive institutions and policies for all in Hawaii. This June, the HPHA board issued a statement on racial justice and health equity and joined the Black Lives Matter March from Alamona Beach Park to the Capitol. HPHA's statement is one of more than 145 declarations that public health associations, boards of health, school districts, and local governments have made in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the civic action that followed for racial justice and equity. The incoming Biden-Harris administration lists racial equity as one of four priorities, along with COVID-19, economic recovery, and climate change. This session will begin to explore the history of racism in Hawaii and how it has affected the health of Native Hawaiians and people of diverse ancestry who settled in these lands. I will read some of the highlights of HPHA's statement. HPHA recognizes racism as a driving force of social determinants of health and equity, a long-standing systemic problem that many in Hawaii's public health and healthcare communities witness and experience firsthand and work tirelessly to overcome. We stand behind our vision of health equity for all and recommit to efforts to eliminate systems, policies, and practices designed to perpetuate systemic racism and limit opportunities for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. 
HBJ calls on the energies and expertise of our over 500 members to help shape the critical decisions that will affect communities now and for years to come. We encourage HPHA members and the larger public health community to join us in efforts to advance health equity and racial justice. Naming, seeing, and transforming the systems of racism we live within is critical to addressing the disparities these systems produce in Hawaii. Our commitment to racial justice it's Naya, it's Steph. Um, we can actually see these, uh, your speaker notes. So if you oh. could try and share your screen again. All right, let's try it again. Oh, hang on. Do you see it now? No. We actually can't see any slides right now. All right, let's try it again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right, let me go back to share my screen. How about now? We can see your notes. Oh, fantastic. Well, um, there you go. Now, now you can't? Correct. All right. But it looks like when I go into them, you can't. Um, okay. How about now? We can see them. All right, so it's not working so well. Um, okay, I'm just gonna stop my share for a minute <laughs> and, um, and then I'll bring it back up again. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna go back to what I was saying. Um, our commitment to racial justice and health equity requires we explore the truths of our history and our present system and collectively identify actions we can take to transform systems that perpetuate racial inequity to systems that promote equity. Since July 2019, I have had the honor of participating in UH Manoa's Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Center, learning about Native Hawaiian worldviews that explore each of our relationships to each other, to place, to our history, and encourages us to discover our kuleana. This centering on how we are interrelated and our responsibilities and privileges to care for each other were the driving forces in creating this session that will begin to provide some of the truth of the history of Hawaii and the forces, structures, and systems that have created our current world. Over the next year, HPHA will continue to offer sessions and more opportunities to learn and move towards action, including the principles explored within the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation work. It is with enormous gratitude that I welcome our speakers and each of you to a centered discussion of racial justice and health equity. Understanding the complex history of the dynamics we live within and that live within us are necessary first steps. To begin, we will hear from two speakers who will outline systemic racism and health equity in Hawaii, and then we will engage in breakouts. So our first speaker is Jonathan Y. Okamura, Professor Emeritus at the University of Hawaii. He continues to serve on the UH Manoa Commission on Racism and Bias. His first position at Manoa was with the School of Public Health, and his last was with the Department of Ethnic Studies, where he taught for 20 years. Professor Okamura is the author of several books, including Ethnicity and Inequality in Hawaii, and Race to Death in 1920s Hawaii, Injustice and Revenge in the Fukunaga Case. And he is also co-author of the ABCs of Community Participation in Primary Healthcare. So welcome, Professor Okamura, and please begin. 
Okay. Well, thanks very much, Tanaya, for that uh, introduction. And I'd also like to thank uh, the officers of the American Public Health Association or the Hawaii Public Health Association for inviting me to speak to you today and, uh, and for everyone for zooming in. So let me uh, call up my slides for my presentation. Uh, is it there? Oh, here. Can y'all see that? Not yet. Not yet. What's going on? Okay, here we go. So to give you an idea of what I'll be talking about, I will first provide basic definitions of racism and discrimination, then move on to uh, institutional racism, structural racism, and lastly, systemic racism. The focus on systemic racism is, is because, of course, it's been used in the media by politicians, community activists, uh, regularly since the killing of George Floyd in May of uh, this year. Joe Biden used the term in his acceptance speech last Saturday. And then lastly, I'll turn to how uh, system systemic racism in Hawaii uh, results in the um, health disparities and inequities that we find. This is, I would argue, through the inequalities among different ethnic groups here in Hawaii. So let's start with racism, very basic, concise definition now. Racism is a belief, it's, a, it's an attitude that especially emphasizes the inferiority of a group considered a race in relation to others. Historically, this belief was biologically based, that groups were born inferior to others uh, compared to themselves in terms of various socially significant attributes, intelligence, personality, sexuality, morality, even things such as uh, musical ability. Uh, at present, most Americans do not believe in biologically based racism. <clears throat> they attribute the inferiority of racial minorities to other kinds of factors. For example, their, their culture resulting in those racial disparities. Now, let me also emphasize that racism <clears throat> at present and, and in the past includes other lesser significant, but also uh, major dimensions. One is the denial of a national belonging. So a historical example, uh, this would be during World War II, 110,000 Japanese Americans were interned during the war because they were not to be, were thought to be disloyal to the United States, even though two thirds of them were American citizens by birth. A contemporary example, I would point to the way in which President, uh, well, soon to be ex-president, uh, Biden, sorry, sorry, Trump, uh, deliberately mispronounced Kamala Harris's uh, first name. By doing so, he and others who have done the same thing are saying that, well, if you're a real American, you don't have a name like Kamala. You should, your name should be Dick or Jane. And similarly, if your name is Pablo, or Jamal or Beyonce, you also are not considered a real American. The other dimension here I mentioned, I uh, have here, the denial of a common humanity. Historically, of course, this was most uh, obvious in how Africans were viewed, going back more than 400 years when the first West Africans were brought to the uh, then British colony of Virginia and sold as slaves. And a, a more contemporary example in Hawaii would be how we view and treat Micronesians, uh, commonly slurred as leeches, cockroaches, insects, or organisms, in other words, not fully human beings like the rest of us. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Jose Ramon Fernandez mentioned something about how we really need to acknowledge the presence of racism in our society. And I hope that by the end of my presentation and, and Becky's and the others, they'll, they'll convince you of this, but we need to be aware of a counter argument to the notion of the existence of systemic racism in society. And that is color blindness, which is the dominant, <clears throat> sorry, ideology in America. Color blindness denies the significance of race. It argues America already is where it should be 
a colorblind society or a post-racial society in, in which race has no formal role. We see this in the repeated legal challenges to race-based affirmative action that have, they began in the 1960s, and today there was a federal court ruling again, uh, in favor of Harvard University that had been challenged for discriminating against students in its race-based affirmative action program. Turning to discrimination, again, a basic definition as opposed to racism. It's action. It's not a belief or an attitude towards another group. It's action, particularly in terms of unfair, unequal treatment, that denies a group uh, the same opportunities, benefits, privileges that others enjoy. Discrimination can be in terms of uh, language, religion, disability, status, national origins, but our focus will be racial discrimination. So when I use the term, that's what I'm referring to. Now, we can go, we need to go beyond individual acts of discrimination and focus on institutional discrimination that occurs to policies, practices, laws that result in the unfair, unequal treatment by which we understand discrimination. And in terms of why it's called institutional discrimination, it's because it occurs in the major institutions of our society, the government, the law, the economy, education. Think of these as huge bureaucracies that operate according to various policies, practices, laws. And this is how the discrimination occurs, not through individual acts on the part of any of the administrators, bureaucrats, workers within these particular government uh, institutions. Point three, institutional discrimination may be legal, it may be unintentional, sometimes covert. To give you an example from Hawaii, some of you might recall in 2009, our governor, Linda Lingo, implemented the policy of the furlough Fridays when the public schools were shut down for 17 uh, days during an already short school year. I consider this policy, policy discriminatory against minority students who constituted 70% of the roughly 180,000 public school students at that time. They were being denied equal educational opportunity by the closure of the public schools for 17 days. The schools were already underfunded by probably about $300 million a year at that time. So the fertile Fridays even worsened that situation more so. I don't think Linda Lingo intended to discriminate against minority students when she implemented this policy, but uh, nonetheless, this is the consequence of taking that particular action. In this case, it was not covert. Everyone was aware of it, but nothing was done about it until a year later. Uh, point four points to changes in society and how we view these issues, particularly in terms of the rightward shift in racial politics as has occurred in America. Coming out of the civil rights movement in, in the 60s, we may have thought we understood that discrimination was. That's when black people were denied the same opportunities as whites. They had to ride at the back of the bus. Uh, they couldn't attend the same schools as whites. Instead, they had to attend underfunded public schools and universities. But over time, discrimination has been redefined as the denial of individual and not just group rights. And this individual can include whites because no reference is being made to uh, race in these definitions. So this is the reason for these anti uh, legal challenges to anti-affirmative action programs in higher education uh, because white students are claiming to be discriminated insofar as they can't participate in these programs. Over time, what has happened is discrimination has been incorporated into notions of racism, evident in the term institutional discrimination. This appears in a book published in 1967 on black power, co-authored by Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton. Black power had just emerged in the summer of 1966. 
In the book, they distinguish between individual racism and institutional racism. But note point two here, that what they refer to as individual racism, I just defined as individual discrimination, overt acts, not a belief or a perception about another group. But note, according to this definition, blacks can engage in discrimination against whites at this interpersonal level. For example, a black employer who doesn't want to hire any whites for reasons of race. So in their book, they provide an example of the long-term practice of institutional racism. And I'd like to read to you a very brief excerpt that provides you a sense of what the segregated South was like during this period. They write, when white terrorists bomb a black church and kill five black children, that is an act of individual racism. But when in that same city, Birmingham, Alabama, 500 black babies die each year because of the lack of proper food, shelter, and medical facilities, and thousands more are destroyed and maimed physically, emotionally, and intellectually because of conditions of poverty and discrimination, that is a function of institutional racism. So in terms of our definition, what their point to is, as I said, this long-term practice of underfunding public facilities in the black community, hospitals and schools. Structural racism introduced by a race scholar named Eduardo Bonella Silva in an article he wrote 30 years later. Uh, there were other race scholars who also discussed the structural dimensions of racism, but this is the article that really had a major influence. As opposed to being, as I said, a belief or an attitude, Vanilla Silva says it's about racial domination, a structure of domination, one race, let's say, whites against other non-white groups in the society, which results in differential economic, political, other kinds of uh, benefits in society among the different constituent racial groups. Turning to systemic racism. As I said, th this term is invoked regularly in the media since the killing of George Floyd by journalists, politicians, community activists, but no one acknowledges who was the scholar who introduced this term, and that's Joe Fagan, a sociologist of race at Texas A&M University. I've never seen anyone acknowledge that he was the one who developed this concept and subsequently to a theory of systemic racism, which he did in several books and articles after uh, first discussing the term. So point two, he refers to systemic racism as foundational. In other words, it's deeply embedded into the very structure of American society. It's evident in the racial hierarchy imposing racial oppression upon racial minorities. One of the points he makes is that ra systemic racism is maintained by whites. This is not necessary for a definition of systemic racism. When we talk about Hawaii, we'll see that whites are not the only group that engages in uh, systemic racism. But the reason for doing this is for, on Joe Fagan's part, he would like to eliminate or at least reduce systemic racism. And he sees pointing to whites as those responsible for its maintenance as that first step in doing so. Now, why does he use this term systemic racism? As a system, like any system, it includes various kinds of components or parts, dimensions that work together to maintain the racial oppression characteristic of systemic racism. Point A, we've mentioned this before, discriminatory practices, institutionalized, but it also can include policies and laws that result in unfair, unequal treatment. For reasons of time, I'll combine B and C together, but they point to political inequalities, socioeconomic inequalities that arise from the social reproduction mechanisms in society, in the economy. In Hawaii, this would be the tourist industry, the largest source of jobs in Hawaii. Also, the uh, educational 
institution, our public schools, the university, that is another force for the maintenance of racial inequalities among groups. Point D, this is closest to that basic definition of racism that I started my discussion. Stereotypes that represent how we view groups in society, representations, how groups are portrayed, depicted in society, especially through the media, narratives, how we talk about, write about different groups. These characteristics are especially evident in the racist treatment of Micronesians in Hawaii, especially through jokes told about them. These jokes stereotype Micronesians, as we said, as freeloaders, leeches, represent them as cockroaches, not even uh, human beings. And they persist in society, disseminate in society through these joke telling, uh, joke -telling about them or these narratives. Lastly, how do we get from systemic racism in Hawaii to the health inequalities, disparities that Becky Delafield will discuss much more so? Well, I would argue it's through the socioeconomic status inequalities that obtain among different groups in Hawaii. We live in a highly unequal society here. According to socioeconomic status indicators, such as occupation, income, educational uh, attainment. For example, the dominant groups socioeconomically in Hawaii are not just whites, also Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans share this dominant overall socioeconomic status as measured by those three objective indicators that I uh, just mentioned. But these are not monolithic groups. They intermarry at very high rates with each other. They live in the same affluent communities in East Honolulu and Manoa with each other. They send their children to the academically prestigious schools in Hawaii, like Punahou and Yolani. This is how, in many ways, they reproduce themselves in that high socioeconomic status. At the lower end of our socioeconomic scale are Filipino Americans, Native Hawaiians, Micronesians, other smaller minorities, including Samoans, Puerto Ricans, and Vietnamese. These groups share a common subordinate socioeconomic status as measured by, again, occupation, income, wealth, home ownership, and educational uh, attainment. The problem in Hawaii, and I would say this is a problem since the 70s, point four, there has been relatively little change in the positions of these groups since the 1970s, after tourism became established as a dominant industry in Hawaii in the 60s. Tourism is the largest source of jobs in Hawaii, the largest contributor to state tax revenues, but it creates largely low mobility, low security, and low uh, wage jobs that do not provide significant opportunities for, sorry, I gotta turn off the phone, or socioeconomic mobility. We've seen this in the tens of thousands of tourist industry workers who have lost their jobs uh, as a result of the pandemic. But even those who don't work in the tourist industry are are disadvantaged by our over-dependence on tourism because state tax revenues have collapsed with the collapse of the tourist industry. What this means is less revenues available to fund government programs and services, including health care and our public school system. Uh, so I'll leave it at that point. I'll take questions if you, anyone has any. Hello, Dr. Okamura. So the first question that we have is, how does poverty underlay or overlay this issue for American society? Poverty? Is that what you said? Yes. How does poverty underlay or overlay this issue for American society? 
Poverty, of course, is a major contributor to racial inequalities, but the kind of inequalities that we can uh, think about in society affect even the working uh, population. We may not necessarily be poor, but they cannot afford, let's say, adequate health care insurance for their families, or they cannot afford to send their children to school. Certainly poverty is a major uh, contributor to racial inequality in uh, American society. But we would find uh, certain different levels of poverty among different racial groups, much higher, let's say, among African Americans than it would be among whites. Thank you. The next question we have is, how do you see status justifying beliefs or the belief in a meritocracy influence systemic racism? How do I see what? Sorry. I want to make sure I'm saying this correctly. So how do you see status justifying beliefs or the belief in a meritocracy influence systemic racism? I may not be pronouncing that correctly. Well, meritocracy is one of those um, major elements of colorblind racism. Huh? As I said, colorblind racism denies the significance of race in society. It emphasizes the role of the individual through merit, through working hard, through uh, an emphasis on equal rights of individuals, not of groups. So that's the counter argument in terms of a colorblind society in which race has no formal significance. So rather than recognizing, acknowledging the racial inequalities that persist in American society, colorblindness argues that, well, we're all at the same level, equal level, and merit is the basis for getting ahead in society, ignoring centuries of discrimination, persisting racism against racial minorities that prevent them from advancing themselves. This is the argument, merit, made by those students who have challenged race-based affirmative action programs, saying, well, because I got the highest grades, I got the highest SAT scores, I should be the one admitted into the college of my choice. Ignoring the fact that the reason that racial minority students have not attained the same degree of SAT scores or GPA, particularly on the continent, because they attend underfunded public schools. Not the case in Hawaii, though, necessarily. Huh? Thank you. The next question is, is systemic racism in Hawaii a contributor to public health disparities and inequities? Well, I'm going to leave that question to Becky. Now, at least in Hawaii, everyone who works has access to health care insurance provided their employer. But the nature of your job, if it's, for example, if it's a low paying job, limits your ability to buy health care insurance for your family, for your spouse, for your children, and the quality of that insurance, the kinds of uh, services you can avail of as a result of the particular policy that you have. Thank you, and we'll do one final question. Um, what is one or two changes in Hawaii that would work, that would most work to dismantle structural or systemic racism? To me, this is so obvious. Fund the public schools to the extent required such that they can provide an adequate education. The schools, according to a study that was conducted, I think 15 years ago, were underfunded by $278 million a year. By definition, they provide an inadequate education. The obvious indicator of this is when the schools open in August, short 1,000 teachers. This is after trying to hire teachers from the continent to come to Hawaii, hiring emergency hire. Well, I wouldn't call them teachers because they're not qualified. Anyone with a bachelor's degree can teach in a public school. You don't need a teaching credential. You don't need the, the um, training provided through 
a college of education to become a teacher in Hawaii. That in itself is an indicator of the inadequate education being provided to public school students in Hawaii. Public education is not a policy priority of our legislators. Furlough Fridays is an example, perfect example of how they do not consider it a problem, a major problem in Hawaii that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Dr. Okamura. I believe we will turn it over to Becky now. Okay, thank you. I think um, if you could stop your screen share. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll just quickly introduce you. Okay. Um, so Rebecca Delafield is an assistant professor with the Department of Native Hawaiian Health at the University of Hawaii, John A. Byrne School of Medicine. Her research interests include maternal and perinatal health, health and healthcare disparities, impacting Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, um, uh, implicit racial bias, and um, she has worked in community-based participatory research. Since May, Rebecca has been involved with the NHPI Hawaii COVID-19 Response Recovery and Resilience Team and is currently associated with the National NHPI COVID-19 Community-Based Needs Assessment through her affiliation with the Pacific Islanders Center of Primary Care Excellence. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to thank you, um, Tanaya, for the introduction and also um, just acknowledge and thank Dr. Fernandez Pena and Dr. Okamura, Public, Hawaii Public Health Association and um, HiFi for hosting this and inviting me to talk today. Um, and thank, to, thank you to everyone who's here and, and hanging on um, during this pandemic and all the work that's being done to promote and um, maintain our public health. So the title of my talk is Racism, COVID-19 and the Health of Hawaii. And um, race and race and COVID-19 and health are very big topics and I can't tackle um, all of them and the full complexity of each of these issues. But what I'm sharing with you is from my background, having examined health and healthcare disparities experienced by Native Hawaiian and other, other Pacific Islanders through the lens of critical race theory and through examinations and conversations about implicit and explicit racial bias um, in the state. And so, um, sorry, my notes are on one side and my screen is on another. So, um, as Dr. Okamura said, Hawaii's race and ethnic, um, racial and ethnic mix is different from um, many other states and shaped by unique historical, cultural, political, and social reality. But while the context is different from other states, racism still operates here. And so um, the critical race theory that I've used to look at health disparities has some key concepts that I just wanted to um, get you familiar with. That race is socially constructed, but that racism, as been mentioned by the other speakers, is real and ubiquitous. And it benefits certain groups over others. And so there's little um, incentive for those in power to dismantle it. Um, but differential race, racialization occurs. And that's really important when we're thinking about some of the um, racism here in Hawaii, particularly for the Micronesian community, which is actually a very diverse group of people, but has been racialized in our social context, um, particularly referring to our um, communities from Kofa nations. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And that races, uh, sorry, identities are not singular, but may overlap and um, conflict. And so that's an interesting dynamic, particularly here in Hawaii, where we have a lot of mixed race individuals and um, also people with indigenous backgrounds. So the settler colonialism inequities and then the race, race racial inequities um, kind of combining. So, um, when you apply these key concepts to health, you understand that racial inequalities in health and healthcare outcomes, quote, do not result from something inherent in people of color, but are consequences of systemic racism's pathways of negative impact. And that's from Fagan, who was mentioned by um, Dr. Okamura too. So um, when I look at these patterns of um, health disparities that are facing Native 
Hawaiians and Pacific Islands and see how they mirror those health disparities facing Black Americans in the United States, I see striking similarities. And so to me and to others, this is um, evidence that the differences that we're seeing are not shaped so much by cultural differences in behaviors or values of any particular racial or ethnic group, but more um, reflective of the behaviors, including policy creation and values of the cultural context in the US and its history of slavery, oppression of indigenous people, genocide and colonial imperialism. So while we've seen improvements over the past centuries um, and the past uh, several decades, we still have challenges. And one of the ways we can advance um, health, and this is kind of echoing a lot of what um, other people have said, including Dr. Kamara Jones, is naming racism and understanding how it operates and working to transform or dismantle these systems. So these are just some points about um, the fact that there is a growing body of evidence demonstrating the pathways by which racism impacts health and healthcare. Um, and one of the things I wanted to point out is just that these, again, are not individual actions, but they're um, systems that are working um, and impacting healthcare. And um, for example, in this first bullet, you see the low quality schools. And I'm so glad Dr. Okamura mentioned that because I really think when we look at our public health system, our public education system here and combine it with the fact that we have uh, such a high number of private institutions um, providing education, you know, you could conceptualize Hawaii as a very um, educationally segregated system for, um, for, for students. So um, research on the impacts of racism on health of communities in Hawaii specifically is growing, but generally there's not a lot about the structural racism and population health outcomes. Um, that work is really complex um, because of the intersections that I mentioned, but um, I think it is emerging and I'm hoping to see more of it. So I wanted to share this quote with you because I think it says a fair amount about the perceptions of Pacific Islanders, not just in Hawaii, but in the US more broadly. And um, as I go through the next part of my presentation, I'd like you to think and reflect, which is something I think is part of this, the conversation I have when we talk about racial implicit bias, um, but also racism in general in our systems, is the importance of um, reflection. And I think I really appreciate what Dr. Fernandez Pena said about kind of thinking about um, humility as we reflect on some of these issues and trying to learn the lessons um, that uh, these experiences are, are providing for us. So the questions I'd like you to think about are, what is the definition of community in this statement? Who is the we in the statement? And how do we forget about people? So I'm sorry if I didn't say it, but this was a statement that was made in August of 2020 by Mayor Caldwell as he was um, talking at a press conference about referencing the disparities that were observed in the positive cases of COVID-19 in the Pacific Islander communities. So I'm going to um, direct my talk specifically to um, the Micronesian community here in Hawaii. And I'm doing that for a number of reasons. Um, the first is because I was born in Micronesia. I'm from Saipan. I identify as Chamorro and white. Um, and so I have a connection to that region and um, the communities that are, live there. Um, although I do not, um, I, I, I'm not from a, a nation within that Kofa um, group. Um, there are a lot of things that are shared within those two communities. So, or within these different Pacific Islander communities in Micronesia. So, the term Micronesian in and of itself is a racialized term, like I mentioned in Hawaii, and predominantly is used to refer to people from the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, and Palau that are all under this compact of free association agreements with the US. Um, this agreement allows residents to move visa-free into the United States in exchange for exclusive military control over those islands. And these communities um, therefore share similar political relationships um, and some histories are shared, but there's also a lot of variation and distinction between these different communities of people, including language, traditions, and histories. So um, 
I want to focus my talk on this community for those reasons, but I also want to say that this does not, I'm not meaning to diminish the impact of racism um, on other communities here in Hawaii. And I think by doing this and trying to use this, um, these experiences as an example of how we see structural racism, I think you can also see parallels to groups like um, Native Hawaiians and Samoans um, in different ways. So, um, so the first thing I want to do is give some historical background on Micronesia. And um, this is important to this talk because it demonstrates one, the formulation of master narratives. Racism is a justification for colonial colonialism and for slavery and this um, effort or objective to devalue people allows other people to act in discriminatory ways that would um, otherwise not be something they would think about doing to fellow human beings and you heard some of the rhetoric that is um, directed at Micronesian communities from Dr. Okamura raised earlier um, that happens when people are considered less valuable um, than others. And, and it justifies things like enslavement, bombing of communities, conducting of nuclear testing in environments um, and in homes, uh, in, sorry, in island homes, and um, justifies neglect in, of our obligations. And it explains, um, by going through this history, it also explains the context of migration. Um, to the U.S., so some of the push factors, uh, the reasons why people have moved here. So colonial, colonialism started in the 1500s in Micronesia, and it was in succession first by the Spanish for hundreds of years, then the Germans and Japanese. World War II was, this, um, um, was, was significant for Micronesian history because those islands were strategically important and there were many battles and bombings that occurred. After World War II, um, the islands were administered, or many of the islands were administered by the US as a strategic trust territory. And the intent of that agreement was to have the US develop um, economics, help with development of economics and social structures, including healthcare infrastructure and political development. But during that time, you also saw, um, it, it also happened that they tested um, 67 nuclear devices in the Marshall Islands. And so that in and of itself, I think is a really telling example of the value um, the US had for those communities and those people. Um, this testing occurred after the bombing of Hiroshima. So people knew what the devastation of the, those bombs were and then the testing that happened in the islands was the equivalent to 7,200 Hiroshima bombs. Um, and this required, this testing process required displacement or, or meant that, that people were displaced from their homes and evacuated to other islands. And um, communities in the Marshall Islands are still suffering the health effects from, from that activity um, in, in terms of human health, but also environmental health. So, Fast forwarding um, to more um, recent history, in 1986 and in 1994, um, the islands of the Federated States of Micronesia and the Republic of Palau, and then later in the 1994, sorry, um, and the islands, um, Marshall Islands, and then later Palau in 1994, entered into compacts of free association agreements, and I mentioned that before. Um, and at that time, then migration to the United States for um, employment and healthcare and educational opportunities that were unavailable in home islands um, occurred. So that's when migration to Hawaii started increasing from those islands. And the involvement of colonial powers, I also want to mention, um, in the US resulted from, uh, also resulted in a transformation of subsistence based economies to wage economies. But then the lack of economic and educational development in the islands, which was noted by the UN that the US had failed in that trust territory time to um, create the conditions for that development that they had promised. Um, that, that development didn't happen. And so without that to sustain the economies, that was a push factor for people to come and get those skills um, and those jobs out um, in, into other places, including the United States. 
um, including Hawaii. So, so in Hawaii, yes, um, there were jobs, there were more jobs, but you can look at this information, uh, this um, graph from a report a recent report in 2018 from the Department of Business and Economic Development and Tourism that shows what the median incomes are broken down by race and ethnicity. And like much of the data on, um, on Pacific oh, Islanders, this is imperfect. Nice. Sorry, I'm, I'm hearing someone. Um, can you make sure everybody's muted? Um, so the Marshallese community is going to be the marker for the other groups that are not included in this analysis but um, for, for communities from um, our, our Micronesian islands, um, specifically from our Kofa, Kofa communities, the Marshallese have the lowest median income um, among these groups that are represented here, a uh, highest percent of, po of, of poverty, and work in mostly private sector jobs. Um, and then also, I wanted to include what types of jobs because you can see that they're forward facing. So this was also something Dr. Fernandez Pena mentioned that people were taking jobs that um, immigrants in the United States are taking jobs that nobody else wants to take, right? Jobs that are lower skill and um, of like jobs that people can get when they have lower levels of education, right? And they pay less. And so if you look at this median income and imagine, okay, they're in the private sector, they might have um, access to some insurance, um, but the ability to pay for additional people onto that insurance is, is very limited. So I also wanted to show you some information on housing. You can see here, um, we talk about multi-generational housing, but actually in Hawaii, I feel like multi-generational multi housing is very common across ethnic groups. But this intersection with this um, rate of poverty also forces people into quality of homes or size of homes um, that are more affordable, which are definitely going to be smaller square footage. So um, we have here the information about household size in terms of people, but we don't have that in terms of square footage. But um, I think there was some information available in this particular report that showed that the Marshallese community was actually paying um, lower per average rent which I think would equate to smaller um, size and overcrowding. So then we get to healthcare access. Um, so about 10 years after, right, the first um, communities entered the compact of free association agreements um, that would allow them to come to the United States visa-free in order to get healthcare and education and apply for jobs. Those things that weren't um, created or um, supported in their own home islands. 10 years after that happened, the federal government ended the, eligibil the eligibility for COFA migrants on, um, to access Medicaid. Um, this act has been criticized for reflecting racist and um, misogynistic ideas in terms of the whole federal act. Um, but the history of Hawaii's actions in regard to Medicaid COVID coverage is documented by many scholars um, and the recent, sorry, and so um, I'm just going to share with you uh, um, that in 2009, the Lingual administration tried to cut state funding for Medicaid for COFA migrants and replace it with Basic Health Hawaii. And this program is just described in this quote by um, Dr. Jojo Peter. By this time, the pervasiveness of vitriolic and explicitly racist rhetoric and social commentary in media indicated an undeniable level of social animosity that likely made politically and politically acceptable and even expedient such a discriminatory policy despite the lack of objective, much less moral justification. So what he's describing here is this proposal from the Lingual administration that was going to drastically cut, um, um, drastically cut um, healthcare coverage for Micronesians who had been up to that point able to stay on Medicaid after 96 because the state was helping support. And this proposal was um, going to limit doctor's visits, it was going to limit the kind of um, uh, care that people can receive, even the people who are on cancer or I believe end stage renal disease. Um, that didn't go through, that change didn't happen. And eventually in 2015, um, um, 
they, the COVID migrants were eligible to enroll into private insurance through the Hawaii Health Connector. Many of you are probably familiar that that program ended. And in 2017, the healthcare.gov um, was the program, the ACA program was the one that um, COFA, communities, COFA communities were eligible for. Um, and this has its own um, challenges, including um, unaffordable co-payments for many people. In addition to just basic access through um, and insurance coverage, there's issues of quality. So language barriers were another thing that um, Dr. Fernandez Pena mentioned for immigrants in the continent. Um, language barriers are also an issue here for um, many of our Micronesian communities. Um, the biggest challenge we have, this is a quote from a paper by Dr. Megan Anada that came out in 2019 is without interpreters, we're not able to educate them on options that are available for their care. And so we've known for a long time that there have been challenges in terms of getting adequate language interpretation services for Micronesian communities. Um, and it continues to be a challenge. And um, I saw this also in some work that I did for um, looking at um, pregnancy and childbirth among Micronesian women. I interviewed uh, providers and in our paper we saw language barriers and communication barriers as well as um, themes of prejudice and bias. And so uh, this is a quote from one of the providers I interviewed. You just hear various comments like they don't take care of themselves or they don't respect our value, whatever those values are. It's kind of um, them versus us thing, putting them into a different population of people really. And that's where you feel like, well, this could lead to bad things. So I wanted to go through all of that to, to demonstrate that prior to COVID, we had identified through research and um, reports that there were, there were um, severe inequalities within this community. Um, and so I also wanted to trace this history by using quotes to show the master narratives coming through as a result of um, the way that this community is perceived and then framed within Hawaii. Um, so this is just a conceptual model that I did to show how policy, which included this exclusion from social safety nets, not just Medi Medicaid eligibility, but also um, ineligibility for food stamps and language access through a practice um, at institutional levels. And then the societal stigmatization of um, the narrative of, of sorry, Micronesians um, as a burden or even more dehumanizing language. Um, and then interpersonal experiences, there have been reports of discrimination, not just in healthcare, um, but also in housing and education. And the, the fear and then the mistrust that this can lead to for people who have been so highly stigmatized in their um, community that they live in and their interactions with people. So this can lead to impacts um, that include limiting limit, limits to access of resources and reinforcing um, marginalization of communities and outcomes such as inequities in health and education and socioeconomic status. And I um, wanna highlight the fact that uh, recently a paper came out from Dr. Molina and other um, authors who I think are probably in this audience um, that identified that there was an increase in mortality among Micronesians after that Medicaid ineligibility um, uh, happened. So between the time when the state cut off um, eligibility for Medicaid and, um, and the, the end of the study period, they saw an increase in mortality. So then layer on top of that, this um, COVID-19 pandemic. And so we've seen, I think most of you are familiar with the fact that there are disparities. And I have here a table that shows disparities um, from November, or sorry, um, COVID-19 um, uh, case rates and also deaths by race and ethnicity. And so this is just the table that um, the bar graph that you see and might be familiar with is from. And you can see that um, the percent of cases is much higher among our Pacific Islanders. It's not um, disaggregated for the different groups, but a large percentage of those are gonna be Micronesian, but also Samoan. Um, it is much higher than the percentage that they represent in our state population. But I also um, did it by cases per uh, 100,000. Um, 
so that you could see how it compares um, to the way that the, the deaths specifically have been um, seen in other minority populations across the United States. So you can really see this disparity here. And granted, these are crude rates, so they haven't been adjusted for age or other factors. But you do see that these crude rates are comparable to um, the rates that you're seeing among Pacific Islanders um, at the national level. And so um, this is, again, imperfect data, but it shows a, a theme. And these patterns are familiar to minority populations. And again, these disparities are not a result of inherent differences between races, but complex, pa complex pathways with systemic racism as an underlying condition impacting health and healthcare access, occupation, economic status, and housing. So if you remember those, um, the conceptual model from my previous slides, this is how I see the pandemic being ampl amplifying those existing inequalities. And so, um, I'll go through them um, more in detail. So in terms of policy, again, it's the restriction from um, being, even though they're eligible for Medicaid, being unable to access Medicaid and food stamps. And these are vital supports, especially in a time of economic downturn where people are losing those jobs that provide even just the most basic minimum wage. Um, and those supports can be um, potentially life-saving. Um, in terms of the um, social and institutional practices, we saw problems were exacerbated by the failure of leadership to anticipate how existing inequalities would increase vulnerabilities for Pacific Islander communities. And in fact, the former Department of Health um, director um, said that he didn't expect to see differences by race, race and ethnicity, perhaps with the exception of NHPIH communities. But what happens then is the result is potentially like not considering some of the needs of those communities in terms of what would um, be um, sorry what would be um, important in terms of providing access to testing right so drive up testing might not be something that people can do if they have to take public transportation to get places or if there's pay barriers for testing um, that might not be something that people can access. And then also um, this contact tracing issue, like were contact tracers um, uh, competent in some of the languages that would be needed for these um, impacted communities? And the answer I think initially was no, and I think that's definitely changed since um, the early part of the pandemic. And then at the, at the societal level, um, ineffective messaging, um, delays and support to communities regarding isolation. So it's really hard to tell people to isolate in their homes when there's so much crowding and there isn't the space to, to do that properly or appropriately. And so providing those supports for isolation, if someone were to test positive or if someone was to be um, exposed or potentially exposed by um, someone else was uh, nearly impossible. And then in terms of the interpersonal level, um, the, sorry, I'm losing track of my, my notes, but for several, um, months, the messaging from the government communicated, was communicated by, by outlets that didn't reach Pacific Islander communities. Oh, sorry, that was not, but, um, the data reporting disparities, um, was a particular concern. For example, um, already documented discrimination in housing and healthcare for Micronesian communities. Um, heightened some of the anxiety at the societal level and tensions for everything. So articles citing disparities in rates of COVID-19 for Pacific Islanders um, attracted racist comments, like an article that was talking about the lack of um, services for Pacific Islanders had comments attached to it by readers that were uh, explicitly racist. Someone said, too spoiled with free handouts already. And another person said um, another derogatory statement. So these impacts have um, real, um, real, um, sorry. Um, sorry, these, these factors can have real impacts on testing, um, the information that goes out around healthcare and, and the information about prevention, 
um, if it's not clear, if it's not in language, if it's not um, timely, it can increase confusion and anxiety in a community that's already at heightened concerns um, in terms of the ability to prevent the disease and the spread and also um, worries about stigma, stigmatization. And so um, what we see then, if you follow this conceptual model, is then disparities in COVID-19 cases and in death. So I want to say, I need to say that too many times people see these disparities or inequities and accept them as realities without questioning why they exist. And so that's, I think, the, like the purpose of this whole conversation is that um, if we don't ask why, the implications can be that these communities are somehow damaged. Um, but the reality is that these communities um, have survived in the face of terrible odds. And so um, it's really, really important to understand that throughout this, even prior to the pandemic and then during, um, and, <clears throat> and still today, there's a, a huge amount of resistance, resilience, and resolve to address these issues by community leaders. So advocates from 2001 were advocating for um, Micronesian communities to be able to get Medicaid at the federal and the state levels. Um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, immediately community leaders who anticipated these needs were coming out and asking um, health healthcare leaders how they can help reach the community in ways that would be appropriate but also effective. And so, um, and I think some of that is, those issues were touched on by um, Dr. Fernandez Pena when he was talking, um, responding to the question about health community health workers and the importance of that. So this is a quote from Dr. Jojo Peter um, again, and I just wanted to talk about it because it talks about resilience. With a foundation, solid foundation of cultural identity and pride and both patience and perseverance, we can rise above the racial noise that has brought so much anguish and pain to our communities here in Hawaii, and that has broken our confidence in ourselves and our place. Empowered with our cultural, with our roots, with our culture, with our roots, we can then establish strong relationships of trust and mutual respect with our host communities, which may lead to a shared future of true pro prosperity. And so if we go back and think about some of those um, questions that I had about this quote that um, I put in the beginning, um, when I reflect on this quote and say, who is the, um, what is the definition of the community here? Um, it's definitely a definition that is not the community of the speaker, right? It's a, it's an othered community, a community that's been racialized and, um, and, and marginalized. And then when I think of who is the we, I don't, I, you know, this is, I don't know. I, I assume he doesn't mean the city and county of Honolulu, but I think he means more broadly the leadership in Hawaii. And, um, we know that there's very little, um, leadership in the in the spaces of power um, that includes our Pacific Islander communities. And then how do we forget people? So we forget people when things are invisible or things are hidden. And for example, that happens when data is masked. It happens um, when the faces of the communities are not at our tables of power. And it happens when the needs and experiences of the communities that we're trying to serve are marginalized rather than centered. And so looking forward, um, I just wanted to give this quote to you that I heard David Duroff, um, who is the director at the Community Health Center, Kokolokalihi Valley Family Comprehensive Services. Um, if we do not address the needs of our most vulnerable groups, our entire community will suffer. And he said that in April, 2020. And um, so proud of the community groups and the providers um, and the workers in public health because there are very, very many who are answering the call. But um, this work cannot be done alone and we should not expect people to do it alone. So those communities affected should not be the one bearing the brunt of this burden. Allies, and I like the way that um, Dr. Fernandez Pena said, allies need to be more than just friends there, they need to be workers. Um, they need to advance actions that center equity. So um, mutually respectful and equitable community partnerships, equity needs to be a center of um, any efforts to distribute vaccines, equity and economic recovery responses, 
And um, I'm hoping this information um, that I shared today are useful as we reflect, we all reflect on the lessons from this experience of this pandemic, because I believe that there's still a lot of time to go that we're gonna be dealing with. And I do believe that we'll see another one. And so it's really important to address the inequities that exist um, now. So those are the references. And I'd like to thank you for the time. I'm sorry, I think I went a little bit over. So I, I'm happy to take any questions. Sorry, Actually, I was a bit nervous. <laughs> no worries, you did wonderful. Um, so I do want to acknowledge all of the questions that I did get in the chat, but because we are um, a little bit over time, I have saved the questions and um, I, two options. One, we can get them to Becky after the meeting. And then the second option is we are about to go into some breakout rooms. So I would encourage you if you feel comfortable to pose those questions while in the breakout. Um, and for now, I'd like to turn it back to Pedro. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for, to both of our, to our panel speakers. It has been absolutely wonderful. Um, Michelle and I are going to move back into our final batch of uh, public health heroes. Um, and Michelle, I will turn it to you. Great. Thank you, Pedro. Yes, this is our last batch of heroes. So I'll get started with our um, first hero to recognize um, Miss Josie Howard. Josie is the program director at We Are Oceania, the Micronesian One Stop Center. Josie has provided exceptional and tireless leadership, advocacy, and collaborative spirit in her work to improve the quality of life, health, and opportunities for the Pacific Islander communities here in Hawaii. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Josie's leadership and strategic direction has served to mobilize and strengthen the response to Pacific Islanders, Micronesians, impacted by COVID-19. As data clearly show the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 in the Pacific Islander community, Josie engaged other community leaders and stakeholders to establish the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander COVID-19 Response, Recovery, and Resilience Team and has vigorously pursued support and partnerships with the Hawaii State Department of Health. Another key effort was her engagement with Pacific Islander faith leaders as influential messengers in the COVID-19 response and focused on expanding their reach via video web conferencing with other Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities in the U.S. continent. This unprecedented collective impact approach has resulted in measurable change and engagement, including strategic dialogue with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, U.S. Surgeon General Jerome Adams, ASPR, FEMA, and CDC, the Governor of Hawaii, Mayor of Honolulu, all to help bring immediate resources and support to address COVID-19 disproportionate impact on Pacific Islanders here in Hawaii and across the U.S. Josie Howard, you are a public health hero. Yay. Our next hero, the Geriatric Workforce uh, Enhancement Program at the UH Medical School's Department of Geriatric Medicine has done a fabulous job training administrators and staff in nursing homes, care homes, and foster homes about COVID-19. Ordinarily, they work in collaboration with a broad network of elder care providers and healthcare facilities to educate on dementia and help them create age-friendly health systems. But in 2020, they quickly pivoted to expand the education and training into COVID-19 and infection control. Facilities participating in this training series have had low infection rates, and now other facilities are joining in. The program is also providing training and equipment to enhance telehealth in geriatrics, and they are working with multiple partners across the aging care network in Hawaii. To the people of the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Project, you are public health heroes. Our next hero is Dr. Tatine Santel. In and beyond her role as director and chair of the Office of Public Health Studies, Tutin has served as an incredible leader of academic public health in Hawaii throughout the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. She has strengthened existing collaborations and worked to establish new relationships with the Hawaii Department of Health and other community organizations to meet the moment of the COVID-19 public health response. 
through a challenging academic climate, including fiscal challenges, leadership transitions, and reorganization, she has worked tirelessly to support students, faculty, and staff as a dedicated leader, and as a caring and, a, and compassionate peer. She has always worked collaboratively to address ongoing public health workforce needs and continues to advocate for more attention to the roles of public health professionals in developing and implementing COVID-19 responses across campus, in our local communities, and beyond. Tatine Sintel, you are a public health hero. The, our next hero, the Hawaii Youth Services Network, has responded to the COVID-19 crisis using a cross-sector collaborative as evidence and evidence-informed approach. The network reached out to youth serving organizations statewide to identify new and emerging needs and in, in issues and bring them to the attention of those responsible for addressing those needs. Identifying gaps in, and cracks in the system has been a top priority. Since March, the network has shared a wide range of COVID-19 resources for youth and families across various sectors of the community and has met with service providers legislators and state county funders to advocate for sustained funding for critical safety net services that address the most vulnerable across the state. The network has also conducted online trainings designed to respond to the COVID-19 crisis, including on substance abuse, parenting, and trauma-informed care. In October, the network convened the 27th annual first virtual Children and Youth Summit, continuing, continuing its commitment to involving youth in public policy development. To the people of the Hawaii Youth Services Network, you are a public health hero. Our next public health hero is Dr. Christina Wang. Dr. Wang has actively responded to the needs of some of Honolulu's most underserved and medically fragile populations during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. From April 2020 to September 2020, Dr. Wang agreed to serve as the medical director for the State Department of Health's Temporary Quarantine and Isolation Center in Ivale, supervising more than two dozen staff. At the same time, she maintained her commitment to serve clients on the street and in the HHHRC's on-site clinic. Her COVID-19 efforts has been featured on Hawaii News Now and the Honolulu Star Advertiser. She started her street medicine clinic six years ago to provide wound care and other services in downtown Honolulu, building relationships of trust and consistency with some of our community's most vulnerable and underserved populations. Dr. Wang mostly treats patients that are homeless, struggling with substance use disorder and or mental health challenges, and often are living with chronic conditions such as HIV. Services include wound care, screenings for HIV, viral hepatitis and STIs, and behavioral health screening, treatment, and referral. She is also an advocate for her clients within medical systems and is a public voice for needed policy changes. Dr. Christina Wang, you are a public health hero. And our final public health hero for the evening, the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Hawaii COVID-19 response recovery and resilience team, a consortium focused on coordinated efforts to collectively address the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on communities across Hawaii, is an innovative leader in responding to the pandemic that has disproportionately affected Pacific Islander communities. The team brings together organizations and individuals to address testing and risk reduction, collection and disaggregation of data, research and clinical capacity, and communicate the availability of resources to communities. Team members highlight needs, mobilize resources, and increase understanding within the broader community to better promote health among all members of our community. To the people of the Native, Haw of the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander COVID-19 Response Recovery Resilience Team, you are a public health hero. And thank you everybody out there for helping us recognize these 16 people and organizations. Tanaya, I will turn it over to you to guide us into the next portion. Thank you so much. So we are going to do a lightning round of breakouts. Um, so um, 
We only have 15 minutes for this. We were hoping for more time, but that's, that's our current reality as we have adjusted to many. Um, so we're going to um, have um, some questions. Um, I will post the ground rules in a second. And we just wanna get some of your initial reactions to the presentation um, you heard. These are not gonna be recorded, but we're gonna take some notes so that we can share them in the report bag and inform the direction and actions taken from here by HPHA. And this is going to um, lead to many more events and discussions. So it's just the beginning and um, just participate as you can. The, um, just a moment. So these are the questions that your um, facilitator will pose and we'll go through them. And um, these are the ground rules, really focusing on listening, um, introducing yourself, and really just trying to reserve judgment and respect differences. So we will now go into the breakouts and um, then we will um, come back in 15 minutes and do a quick report back. All right, I think you guys can hear me. Um, so I'm just gonna give a, a quick summary of some of what resonated. Um, so a lot um, focused on um, Dr. Delafield's talk um, about what got us to this place, um, what, Dr., what Professor Okamura brought up around the educational disparities, that um, the educational system is leading to a lot of the economic disparities that we see um, and that um, the Micronesian culture um, is often not viewed in terms of its history and um, that that often leads to a lot of the um, the comments and just just people's recognition of the pervasiveness of the racist comments towards Micronesians, um, and um, people have definitely seen this, you know, pervasively in their work, um, and um, feel that there's um, a need to do better training. Um, on institutional racism, to um, integrate youth voices, to find ways to communicate um, with more social media, and to um, really consider the educational part and, and how that can be integrated in. Um, just a moment. Um, there's definitely a desire to increase diversity at the table um, and to look at the impact and pervasiveness of tourism in Hawaii um, and to really identify more topics and to have um, a series of learning opportunities, brown bags that create space for additional conversations. Um, there's a desire for more public health resources in rural and underserved communities. And um, um, 
just look at one more thing. Um, and and just really trying to figure out how we can translate these complex issues into more um, actionable bites. So um, I really appreciate you joining this very quick initial conversation, and I welcome you to more in-depth conversations over the next year. Thank you, Tanaya. Um, can you all hear me? Thumbs yes. up? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Great, thanks. That was just absolutely fantastic. I um, really enjoyed all of the presentations and uh, loved that we had an opportunity to meet with our best friends and talk story about um, this issue, a very critical issue and um, how this plays out manifests in Hawaii. I hope this isn't the last of the conversations. I, I know um, that uh, there are several very invested um, leaders and together with all of you, we're gonna be able to carry this, this forward and see how it shapes out. But um, I'm looking forward to that and to being part of that. But let me just um, ask you all to join me. Um, let me pull this up as a... Uh, full slide. There we go. Um, to join me in um, cheers, a toast, not a long one, just a short one to all of you who um, have worked so hard this year. I'm just just hats off to all of you and all the heroes that were recognized and, and many other heroes that we didn't have time for um, in, in recognizing um, this evening. But it's been such an honor um, seeing just the work and the action that you're all um, really taking and it just very humbling. I wanna... Um, take you back a little bit uh, since we're celebrating 75 years. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this 40 year history of public health and Hawaii Public Health Association written in 1985 um, by a couple gentlemen, one charter member um, of HPHA. And um, if you haven't seen it, please visit our website because it's kind of interesting to just journey back and see what it was like, what the issues were at that time. A lot of talk about venereal disease, which I found, found interesting. Um, but the mission back then in 1945, when we were first chartered, um, was to aid in the promotion and protection of public health and to provide for the professional advancement of members. And today it's very similar. Um, maybe a little bit broader, but to promote public health in Hawaii through leadership, collaboration, education, and advocacy. And um, it's only through, you know, the engagement of all of you as members that we're able to make that happen. And so um, I really thank and acknowledge the work that you all put into this organization and um, to making us healthy as an organization, as a community of public health professionals as well as students. Um, I want to also point you to one other great resource, and this is uh, something that Gerald Ota has put together for us. If you haven't seen it, definitely um, visit the YouTube. It's called Hawaii, a unique public health history. Um, it goes all the way back to Cook and uh, 1700s, um, focusing some of the on some of the big, um, you know, the pandemics and uh, introduction of disease in these islands and, um, and through to more recently. Um, we are a community over 400 strong. Um, these are folks that have uh, 
paid, uh, they're, they're updated on their membership. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, in particular our lifetime members. Um, those that are highlighted were new lifetime members this year. Thank you all for your long-term commitment to HPHA. And if you are joining us and you're not a member, um, let me take this opportunity to just encourage you to join us. Um, the more the merrier. We, um, you know, we're a broad, uh, we represent a broad um, scope of uh, professionals. And so um, we welcome you to HPHA. And likewise, on behalf of a APHA, the American Public Health Association, um, that's another great um, forum to be a part of. Lots of opportunities for leadership and, and growth. Um, let me just thank everybody who contributed to tonight's program. Um, certainly our speakers, Dr. Jose Ramon Fernandez-Pena, Jonathan Okamura, and Rebecca Delafield. Thank you again for this really um, thought-provoking and important um, presentations. And then the planning committee, all the folks that you heard from today, all our breakout facilitators. I want to make a special shout out to Tanaya for all her work in pulling this together. It's just been excellent tonight. Um, really thank you so much for your leadership on this front. Um, and Stephanie Moore and Makamai Namahoy, um, thank you for your behind the scenes facility once again. Um, our sponsors, event sponsors, uh, Medicines 360 and HiFi, Hawaii Public Health Institute. We can't do this without your support.